Try and, try and imagine or try and remember, if you can, when maybe you were a child and you went to a theme park for the very first time. Can you remember what that feeling feels like the very first time you get in a roller coaster? The very first time. Maybe? Yes? Okay, let's assume you do. Now, if I asked you after you had done that to record your feelings somehow, you were going to write about it or you were going to talk about it or you were going to draw a picture for me, I bet a reasonably large portion of you would choose to talk about it and perhaps a small portion of you would choose to write about it and an even smaller probably to draw about it because not everyone's particularly fluid in drawing, let's say. And actually that is, to an extent, the entire history of iconography in, in the world because iconography is not just, um, not just about these images that you see here in churches. Iconography is effectively about image making and humans have always been image makers. If you go back to the very first point in history when we see these um, caves in, in Lascaux, in, in Australia, in all over the world, you see, you see image making people all the time. And so people are just, just excited to record their feelings and their emotions. Now let's fast forward like 2,000 years and go to the point where Jesus is on the earth. And of course people can't contain their emotions. They've got to do something to explain how they're feeling about this man. This man is rocking their world. It's completely changing and rock and rolling everything upside down. You've got to talk about it or you've got to write about it or you've got to draw about it. Of course, Luke was one of the first people who drew about it. He was one of the first people who actually created images um, of the Virgin Mary. Right, now let's take a step back from iconography for a second. And, uh, and I want to say something, something maybe that actually hit me really this morning when I was trying to prepare mentally for this talk. And I realized even now while I'm talking, a miracle is happening in this room, a genuine miracle. What, what is the miracle that's happening in this room? You are being made more like Jesus without you even trying. Just by virtue of Jesus' promise to you, he is making you more like himself right now. If we go to the Greek, the word is theos. If we go to the Latin, it's deus, if my Latin is incorrect. You are being deified. You are being changed to be like Jesus all the time. And why am I bothering to say that? Because actually, it has an enormous amount to do with iconography. When we, when we go in our minds to the transfiguration, anyone know the story of the transfiguration? No one should be too, um, too far into it. Transfiguration is a moment when Jesus took Peter, James, and John to Mount, the mountain. And on the mountain, he was transfigured before them. He became shining like the sun. They could see both God and man in one person. Now, the interesting thing about the transfiguration, we always talk about it as if Jesus was being transfigured before them. But take it from another point of view. Perhaps it was, in fact, Peter, James, and John who themselves were transfigured. If we go to the New Testament, we're told that when we're in heaven, we will see him as he is because we will be like him. It requires us to be like him to see him as he is. Otherwise, all we'll see in the case of disciples, is the human fleshly figure before us. When our eyes are open because we become like Jesus, when we are deified as we go along the world in our time, suddenly our eyes are able to see things we've never seen before. We're able to see the spiritual world, not just the human world. And that is actually what iconographers very selfishly try and impose on you when they make their icons. They're trying to fast forward your deification, you're becoming like Jesus, you're becoming like Christ to now, to right now. They're trying to open your eyes, not just the human part of the world, not to the, just the beauty of the natural body, not just the beauty of the curves of a man or a woman, or you know the beautiful eyes that you can see on a man or a woman, but the spirituality, the Holy Spirit glowing inside them. The resurrection already happened inside them. I'm gonna take another side step. I do this all the time. I go from one point to the other, to the other, to the other. <clears throat> this building that we're in, does anyone know the name of this area of the church? I'm sure you all do, but somebody just shout it out. What is the name of this area of the church? Come on, guys. No? It's the nave. The nave. Who knows where the word nave comes from? Navis. Navis means boat. So what is that area inside called? Either the Holy of Holies or the sanctuary. Now, they carry with them beautiful, beautiful poetic meaning. So the novice, if it's a boat, is carrying us on our journey towards the Holy of Holies. And if I were to open up that curtain, I'm sure all of you know what's inside there. It's Christ in a circular mandala, circular radiance. Almost looks like a target 
Christ is our destination. This is our boat, that's our destination. So I guess the question sometimes people ask me is, what does that make, what does that make the screen? What does that make the iconostasis? Is that a barrier for us to hit and bang into and bash our heads against and say, oh, I'm still not there, I'm still not there. It's not, it's anything but a barrier to the Holy of Holies. On the contrary, if this is a boat, and that is our destination, heaven, so if this is earth carrying us towards our destination, heaven, the iconostasis is actually a bridge, a visual bridge of the reasons for our salvation. So who, who can we liken the iconostasis to? Who is the way? Who is the gate? Who is the reason? Who is the bridge? Christ, in fact, is the iconostasis. He is, I mean, if you, if you think of kids sometimes when they go to fun fairs and they say, oh my God, look at that badge, look at that badge, I wanna buy all these badges. And every badge they put on them, to some extent, tells us about that kid, doesn't it? You know, they're gonna put a badge that says, I love football, or I love soccer, or I love, I love McDonald's. Um, yeah, well, that'd be great. <clears throat> every badge that you see on this kid tells us something about that kid. Now imagine this iconostasis, metaphysically or symbolically speaking, is Christ. And every icon on Christ is a badge, a historical badge telling us something about Christ, telling us the reasons for our salvation. So I thought today we could just go relatively briefly through each icon and, uh, and just understand a little bit more about it. I know that you guys have um, an open doors policy coming up in about a month's time and uh, you're going to open the doors to the public. Um, and thankfully Abuna and I have been working on a description of every single one of the icons so that anyone who wants to read can understand some of the symbolisms. I thought I'd just explain it today so that when you read it for a second time, it might stick in a little better. But before I do, actually, can I just ask, does anyone have any burning questions that I make sure I answer in the next 15 minutes before I finish? Well, think about them if, they, if you do. And if I haven't answered them by the end of the 15 minutes, would you just put up your hand and maybe I can answer them then? So, okay, so we understand that the iconostasis is anything but a barrier between us, the followers of Christ, and the destination, the target, which is Christ, the Holy of Holies. This is earth, that is heaven, symbolically speaking, and we are traveling on this boat to the target. The iconostasis is our bridge from the boat to our destination, a visual bridge showing us all the reasons for our salvation. So let's go through them chronologically, shall we? Because they're not actually in chronological order, as I'm sure you know. So where is the first one chronologically on this icon? Mary, first chronological icon on this iconostasis. Yeah, I asked you. Too slow. Mina, what's the first chronological icon on this iconostasis? Yes, the three youth, exactly. So back in the time of Daniel, we have the three youth. So what's powerful about this icon? What is it, what is it trying to tell us or teach us? About, again, try and, try and see everything in light of the bridge, in light of Christ's bridge. What are they saying about Christ? In the time of Daniel, they were expecting a Messiah. They, were ex they, 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 had just, they had just begun to understand from Daniel's prophecy that there might well be hope for, for the nations of, of, of the world. A hope that finally the bridge, the, the gap that had, that had been made by Adam between us and the Father would be bridged. That there would be a saviour to carry us over this big precipice that we couldn't quite get past. Does anyone know where that halo, which is on the angel, is seen elsewhere in the iconography. Just scoot around with your eyes. Tell me, where else is that particular halo seen? Yeah, on Christ, exactly. That halo is actually reserved for Christ. Those three prongs on the halo are supposed to be, make up a very simple diagrammatic cross. And within each prong, you'll see three lines telling us that actually the moment of the cross wasn't just about Jesus, it was about the entire Trinity. All of them were working together to bring us the miracle of the cross. So why is Christ's cross on that angel's head? Anyone? Think about, think about when, when these three youth actually were in the fire. What did King Nebuchadnezzar say? He said, I, th I see the three youth, the three men walking around the fire unhurt. And I see a fourth one and he looks like the son of the gods or a son of the gods. So we are in a meditative way alluding to the possibility that in fact it might have been Christ himself. Of course it would be 
a little heretical of me to say it was definitely Christ. We can't know. But it's a lovely meditation that perhaps this was Christ himself, one of the first viewings or, 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 or sightings of Christ in the, um, in the Old Testament. Next chronological icon, Mina. Oh, you're on the phone. Oh. Would it? The, yeah, I think it's, yeah, I think you're right. I think it's the Annunciation. All right, so let's scoot over to the Annunciation. What is it? I mean, it's quite obvious what the Annunciation has to do with the Messiah, Jesus. If it's, it's Gabriel telling, telling the good news to Mary. You know, peace be with you. And of course, he's holding, he's holding what in his hand? He's holding, well, it's a bit subtle, but he's holding an olive branch in his hand. Peace be with you, sign of peace. And he's holding the staff of an archangel just to show us that hierarchical-wise, he is an archangel rather than a lowly angel. Peace be with you. I have good news for you. And of course, his hand is gesturing and giving way to the Holy Spirit overshadowing her as we read in the, in the, in the description of the Annunciation. So let's just talk briefly about, um, about the other things in the icon. It's actually relatively, um, what's the word when we argue about things? Controversial. It's relatively controversial to show the Holy Spirit as a dove in this icon. Does anyone know why? Marianne, take a guess. Why is it controversial to show the dove in this icon? Hold it, Mina. Marianne's dead. Does it scripturally? It does. It does. The Holy Spirit of Shadow. But isn't it a bit restrictive? And I'm going to contradict all my work till date. Isn't it a bit strange to show the Holy Spirit as a dove in this instance, in this context, historically? He only showed himself as a dove on one occasion, didn't he? Right. So it is controversial speaking, uh, uh, controversial to say, actually, that the Holy Spirit is sh being shown as a dove. Of course, we don't have any other physical instances of us seeing the Holy Spirit. We see, of course, the flames in Pentecost, or perhaps we hear the, the strong wind during Pentecost, but we, don't, we haven't seen him as a dove during this. But since we don't have any other physical symbols to show the dove, to, to show the Holy Spirit, we use him as a dove. But just so you know, you may have Greek or Russian iconographers coming to this church saying, you shouldn't be a dove. Perhaps your, your uncle or something will walk in and say, you shouldn't be a dove. <laughs> and he wouldn't be tec technically wrong. Um, let's talk about the colors on the Virgin Mary's outfit. A Virgin Mary actually has um, a lot of interesting meditation about her outfit, but um, let's just talk about this icon in particular. Right at the back, somebody tell me what the blue and the brown symbolize in this particular icon of the Annunciation. Just take a stab. Earth and sky, that's actually a perfect description. Um, so brown, brown looks like the earth. And so when we, when, we, when we use brown, generally, we're speaking about the humble, the humble lineage of Adam. He was made from earth or red mud. Adam literally means red earth. He was made from earth. And so whenever we use brown, we're saying this person is humbly from the lineage of Adam. They are still human. So what does the blue mean? Why have we also dressed her in a divine blue? Anyone? Heaven? So what are we saying? Is it just like a poetic way of saying she's heavenly? It's a bit far-fetched, isn't it? Actually, truthfully, culturally speaking, blue was the color um, denoted to virgins at the time. So she, it, when, she's, when she's dressed in blue, it's, it's as a virgin. However, if you want to get really deep and technical, we can actually go to the ancient Egyptians who had, um, if anyone has studied Egyptology, had a goddess called Nut. Now, Nut was actually the goddess of the sky who every day would give birth to the sun god Ra, and every day he would return back to her again. Where, have we, where, where can we parallel Ra to Christ? Malachi, anyone? No, it's far-fetched, I know. I wouldn't know it if I didn't read about it. Malachi says, and the son of righteousness, spelled S-U-N, son of righteousness will deliver healing in his wings. He will go out with healing in his wings. So poetically speaking, if, if, uh, if you wanted to, or as the early Christians did, because it really wasn't very far away from the ancient Egyptians in time, they actually said, perhaps the Virgin Mary, poetically, is like Nut, and Christ is like Ra, and he is coming out as the son of righteousness and going back into her again. So when you see, especially for instance in the flight to Egypt, which we'll come to in a second, when you see her in blue, and especially with stars speckled all over her, we're assigning her the role of Nut from ancient Egyptian mythology. I know it's a bit far-fetched and you think, well, what has ancient Egyptian mythology got to do with our current Christianity? Surely that's idolatry. But one of the wonderful things if we look at the flight to Egypt is this bird, this Ibis bird, Anyone know which god in ancient mythology in Egypt was like the Ibis bird? 
Anyone? No, Horus was actually a, a, di a, different, a different head slightly. Um, the Ibis bird actually was a, a very strangely named god called Thoth. Try and pronounce that. Thoth. Thoth was the bringer of truth and religion to the ancient Egyptians, or so they say in the mythology. So, and his head was like that of an Ibis bird. So when we have in this icon the Ibis bird bowing or flapping, he's almost ushering in, gladly ushering in, the true religion, the true monotheistic religion, where ancient Egyptians used to have a polytheistic religion, where they believed in many gods, he's ushering in and saying, actually, we gladly welcome in the true religion, true Christ. Palm trees. Anyone know what palm trees are a symbol of in iconography? I'm doing a lot of pausing. Clearly, you guys don't know much. Okay. <laughs> palm trees, funnily enough, were actually um, always seen as a symbol of triumph and victory. Why? Because they were so, comparatively to other trees, they were so strong, so tall, that they were seen as kind of able to withstand anything, able to live through anything. They were victorious trees in their existence. So palm trees actually were usually, and if we go, for instance, to um, Christ's entry in Jerusalem, we know that palm trees were being thrown around. And they said, Hosanna, welcome to the king of the, king of, uh, of the Jews. Well, Hosanna to, um, to the descent of David. Um, so palm trees in this, in this scenario, and you can see in the angel's hand, he's waving a palm around, he's saying, welcome, welcome into the, welcome the, the, the victorious king of glory into, into Egypt. Um, if you look in the very far right of the flight to Egypt, you'll actually see the lotus flower. The lotus flower has a beautiful, beautiful uh, meditation in ancient Egypt, and they are all along the banks of the Nile, the Egyptian lotus flower. They actually, in the nighttime, they close up and they descend into whichever river they're in. And in the morning, they rise up again. So, of course, they're a symbol of rebirth and resurrection. So in this icon, they're being used as a symbol prophesying about Christ's death and his resurrection. So that's what the lotus flower is. Let's go back to the icon over here. I, I love the meditation about wings. Does anyone, can anyone guess, and I, maybe I haven't done it very well, but can anyone guess what the wings are trying to look like, which animal they're trying to look like? Which, which animal has wings like that? And maybe I've done it badly, and maybe I'll just have to tell you. Yeah, go on, Mina. Eagles. So what relevance do eagles have in the Bible? Funnily enough, eagles are mentioned over 30 times in the Bible. And um, there's a lovely fact about eagles. They are one of the only, if not maybe the only animal, who can successfully stare directly at the sun. And daily, they spend minutes at a time directly staring at the sun with ears, pour, with, not ears, uh, tears pouring down their eyes in order to cleanse their eyes. Probably at much pain <laughs> and suffering. Isn't that just a lovely parallel to what you know, the ho Holy of Holy Saints and the Holy of Holy um, Angels must be doing around Christ all the time, staring directly into the sun, pouring with tears down their face. So... Um, so that's why you'll actually find in, in the cases where angels are shown throughout, you'll see them in relatively dark brown wings or golden brown wings, trying to look like angels' wings. Um, all right, so we've gone chronologically from that one to the Annunciation to the flight to Egypt. Where's next? Let's go to the enthroned Mary. Um, now, I have to admit, I kind of regret doing Christ as big as I did in this because ideally he should have been a little bit more of a toddler. Um, so... White and, white and red. Why is Christ always dressed in white and red? Again, this has a lovely, like, beautiful symbology about it. Yeah, go on. It symbolizes what? Death and life. So, okay, so the red would be death in this case, and the white would be life. Yeah, it's actually, yeah, that's a nice kind of way about it. Um, in fact, it goes even deeper. Now, that's not entirely wrong, actually. It goes even deeper. White, for those physicians among you, white is actually, um, white light contains what? Contains all the colors of the spectrum. So white, in this case, isn't just a symbol, a simple, simple symbol of purity or life. It's actually um, a, a symbol of completion, of complete immersion, complete oneness, complete, um, well, how else could you describe it? In the white, he contains everything. He is all in all. So the white is essentially the godly color, the holy color, the all-encompassing color. So red, as he said, anytime you see a blood red in this um, in this icon, it is one of two things. It is martyrdom, so blood, 
or it is, it is regal royalness. If we go, for instance, again to the icon of Mary enthroned, she's actually, if you look at Psalm 45, there are a few verses. One that says, uh, and on your right hand is sat the queen. We sometimes sing that in our hymnology. As David has said in the book of the Psalms, upon your right hand, O king, did stand the queen. So you, you will always see Mary on Christ's right hand side. It also said, and she was overlaid with gold. So you'll usually see in the icons of St. Mary, some trimming of gold. And, on, and underneath is, uh, is, her, is her red. So we actually, and this is, um, this is something I actually re, uh, only very recently um, fully understood. When we look at um, back to the 1970s, Coptic iconography was being redesigned by someone called Isaac Fenus. Perhaps some of you would have heard his name. Isaac Fenus was just a genius artist that he'd been commissioned by Pope Carulus. I think he's a genius anyway. And, um, and what he did, he took the paradox of Christianity. So what is the paradox of Christianity? That the God of heavens, the omnipotent, the uncontrollable, the, you know, the God who cannot be contained, suddenly was contained in a body. And the God of the heavens who could have been born in the most beautiful palace was born in a manger. This paradox of Christianity that happens all through our, our biblical lives. We're like, how does this happen? Great becomes small. Love becomes, or hate becomes love. You know, grace, grace is given to everyone regardless of, of their background. Beautiful Christian paradox. So actually, Isaac Fanus took that paradox and he said, I'm going to give that paradox to Mary's clothing. Whenever she is glorified in her icons, I'm going to dress her generally in a humble brown. Sometimes we tint the brown purple, as I've done here, rather liberally. Uh, and when she is not glorified, when she's humbled, I'm going to glorify her in her dress. So, in the flight to Egypt, she's being humbled because she's acting as a refugee. She's, she's having to, to, to give to the world something that, you know, is pretty, pretty torturous to give. She's going to have to travel all this way. So he's dressing her in a glorified blue as the queen of heavens. When she's being glorified as the enthroned... And again, try and imagine this purple is more of a brown. I've been a bit liberal with the purple. She's actually being clothed in the brown, which is the lineage of Adam and Eve. He's saying, he's saying she is a humble human only, even if we're glorifying her. Let's go to the next icon, which is Christ enthroned. Um, this is a question that comes up a lot. What on earth is this? this? This odd hand symbol. And then in Greek, you'll see it something like this. Or you might see it like this. Or you might see, like, there are so many iterations. Any ideas what's happening here? Is it a sign of blessing? We use it frequently as a sign of blessing. But, um, and, and, and some might argue that in Buddhism, it actually originated as a sign of blessing. Buddhism being one of the oldest religions. In Greco-Roman times, there were certain varieties. But generally, this was the sign of the orator. Someone who was teaching. Someone saying, hey guys, listen up. I'm about to say something important. So in the icon of Christ here, although it might be construed as, um, you know, Trinitarian, three in one, it is in fact the, um, the sign of the orator, the person teaching or being listened to. That's why we can even take liberalities and just flex the little finger downwards. Otherwise, that Trinitarian idea doesn't really make sense, does it? That's why I've kind of flexed the little finger away, just so it's keenly not seen as a Trinitarian three in one. In Greek, you'll actually sometimes see it this way which, um, although it's a little bit difficult to see, it's actually, um, I've forgotten the word when you take a long word and you make it just a few letters. What's the word? Is it anagram? Abbreviation, uh, something like that. One of those, whatever someone said. <laughs> it's actually, it's actually um, a spelling of the word, Isos Christos, the finger being the I, middle finger, sorry, the middle finger being a C, Isos, these two being a cross, Chris, and this is being another C, Isos Christos. And in early, very early Coptic iconography, because we were so heavily influenced by the Greeks somewhere in the middle medieval period, you'll see that a lot, actually. But in the 1970s, when Isaac redesigned the um, icon style, he actually said, no, let's move away again from the Greeks. Let's use the hand of the orator, as we sometimes did before. So that's what you're seeing here, the hand of the orator. Um, again, you'll see him in white and red, for the same reasons as before. Now, one thing perhaps you'll notice, and it looks like a bit of a mistake, is... Why are the carpets just so square? It doesn't make any natural sense. Where is the, like, the natural perspective of the carpet moving towards us? Anyone? I mean, and, and for that matter, why, why are icons in a strange, abstract style? You know, why, why aren't they just all naturalistic? Why doesn't Christ look exactly like a human? Why does he look a little bit alien? 
<laughs> I get asked that question so much. Uh, in fact, Abuna asked it to me yesterday, and uh, for the life of me, I was so tired I couldn't give a proper answer. Um, well, there are lots of reasons for it, um, and, I, and I, sometimes, I sometimes use this lovely poem from William Blake, who's an English poet from many centuries ago. He has a very short poem, and part of it goes like this. The vision of Christ that you see, or in Old English he says, that thou dost see, is my vision's greatest enemy. Thine, or yours, has a hook nose like to thine, like yours, and mine has a snub nose like to mine. What he's really saying is we all, in our perfect imaginings, see Christ differently. I'm sure when you all close your eyes, Mina sees it differently to Marianne, sees it differently to Mary, sees it differently to Abuna. Christ is something different, someone different to all of us, ever so slightly, or maybe in a very big way. Just like St. Paul, to the Greeks became Greek, to the Romans became Romans, and to the Jews became a Jew. He, Christ takes on something different for all of us. And so William Blake is saying, actually, there's, there's no way to really describe Christ precisely without offending somebody's perfect imaginings of Christ, of Christ in their mind. So what can we do? We abstract him, we reduce him to a human. Yes, a Jewish man with long hair, sure. With a beard, sure. Anything else, we're beautifying someone that we don't know exactly. Admittedly, when we have a, an icon of, say, Pope Carolus, or anyone that we know for sure, that is exactly what they look like. Of course, they look a little bit more naturalistic because we wouldn't be able to really make an icon of Pope Carolus and have it look someone completely different. But when it comes to Christ and when it comes to the other saints, generally speaking, we've abstracted the style. We're trying to remove your focus from the natural beauty of the world, the natural beauty of the human body, the natural beauty of natural perspective. And we're trying to make you focus on the spiritual instead. If you remember when I was talking at the very beginning of the meeting, I was talking about your eyes transfiguring like Peter, James, Peter, oh, Peter, John, and James. There you go. Peter, John, and James. It wasn't, it wasn't so much Christ being transfigured on Mount Tabor. It was their eyes. They were being transfigured. They, for a beautiful, brief moment, had become like Christ and therefore could see Christ as he really was, like we will. Um, there's a lovely story, actually. Um, my dad used to tell me of Pope Carolus. And, um, and dad has a friend who was serving as a deacon with Pope Carolus one, one mass. And... Um, and people were coming up for, for communion. And every now and again, Pope Carolus would put his hand on them and move their head to the side without giving them any communion. And the deacon was like, I don't know why. So he leaned over to Pope Carolus. He said, what's wrong? Why, why are you doing that? And Pope Carolus said, can't you see? And the deacon said, no, I, I can't. They look like normal people to me coming up for communion. And Pope Carolus put his hand on, on the deacon's head and he said, Lord, may you help him see. May you help him see with his spiritual eyes. And, and this deacon apparently blinked a few times, opened his eyes, and lo and behold, he could see a few people in the queue with their faces completely blackened, as if, as if, as if they didn't have a face. He could just about see features, but completely blackened. And Pokola says, can you now see? And he said, yes, what is that? He said, those are the people who aren't ready. And so there is something, there is something indescribable that we will all face as we're being deified, as we're being made to be like Jesus, our eyes are going to start to change. If we start to see with the spiritual eyes of our heart, there is something we're going to see that we don't see now. Look at all of the icons. What do you see around people's heads? Halos. What are the halos for? The thing about orthodox iconography is we are not, we are not trying to help you enjoy the beauty of man. We're trying to help you enjoy the beauty of God. What you're seeing here are men in their resurrected bodies, shining with the Holy Spirit. Not just men on earth, but these are the resurrected saints all around us. So we're trying to say, as Orthodox iconographers, please don't just think of these people as historical artifacts. This isn't a museum of images. These are the people who are alive and well right now, standing with you, praying for you, urging you to, to, to be like them as much or to be like Christ more specifically to be like Christ and they are shining with the Holy Spirit from inside even when you see someone who's been martyred someone who is who, who died historically in a gruesome way we're not trying to portray their martyrdom and if, even if we do it's a tiny little image on the side but the person stands resurrected before you like St. Maurice they're resurrected shining with the deified beauty of their resurrected body so as orthodox as Orthodox Christians looking at an icon, you are trying to be encouraged to see not just with the human eyes, 
but with your spiritual eyes that are yet to come. Try and see the life that is all around you, but that you can't quite see yet. Try and be transfigured every time you see it. Okay, let's go to, um, let's go to the icon in the very corner. I promise just like five, ten more minutes and I'm done. I can see some of you are like, oh, this is so dull. If you feel like that, please just bow your heads and say, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Make this guy shut up. <laughs> okay, let's go to the, to the Christ with the children. Um, let's go to the, the, the weird things in, in the icon first, because some of them are very obvious. There's children, there's Christ. We've seen that story before. What are the rocks for? Are the rocks just strewn around everywhere because I fancied doing something in this icon that was weird? No, where have we heard, where have we heard rocks before in the New Testament out of Christ's mouth? Anyone? Where did Christ mention rocks? Yeah, go on, Murray. Yeah, exactly. When Christ entered into Jerusalem, the Pharisees were rebuking his disciples and his followers saying, what do you think you're saying? What the hell do you think you're saying? Uh, Jesus, you've got to stop them. And Jesus said, I tell you, if they stop praising, the rocks would cry out. Somebody has to be praised here, and it's going to be God. God is going to be praised. So you can see the, the children are, are victoriously throwing around palms. Welcome, King of the Jews. Welcome, Son of David. Welcome, Jesus. And there are still rocks around. They would cry out if these children stopped. What are the birds for? Anyone? Abuna, what are the birds for? Take a stab. Are they just pretty? Because I, I had some space in the sky. I needed to fill them. How precious people are. Exactly. Look at the birds of the air. Aren't they more precious? Aren't you more precious than birds of the air? Yet Christ our God feeds them. And you can see birds being fed down at his feet. You're more precious even than the birds. Uh, okay, that's that icon. Let's move to, let's do to the Theophany icon. Anyone know why this icon is called the Theophany icon? Sometimes Epiphany, sometimes Theophany, sometimes the, just the baptism of Christ. What does Theophany mean? Mm, Monica. Theophany. Theo, what does Theo mean? God, Phanios, Phani, no? Theophany, it's the, it's the appearance of God, the full appearance of God. In this case, we have an appearance in some respect of all three members of the Trinity, all three hypostasis. We see Christ in his body, we see the Holy Spirit as the dove, and what is that squiggly line looking like it's emanating from the dove, but in fact emanating from heaven? Weirdly enough, it's our very simple iconographic purpose way of showing a sound wave, the voice of God. It's a sound wave. Can you see it? The squiggly line emanating from heaven. So we see the dove, the sound waves, the voice of God, the Father, and Christ in his body. Um, who knows what those two trees are meant to indicate down the bottom? They have a few meanings, but let's, let's talk about the most obvious ones. Anyone? Over here? Tree of life. It's not a bad guess. Anyone else? It's, it's wrong. Anyone else? <laughs> Anyone else? It's bearing fruit. So what is suggesting? Right. Okay. Exactly. So, in fact, there was a moment where the Pharisees came to St. John the Baptist and were rebuking him and saying, who are you? What are you doing? And, you know, he really rebuked them back and he said, brood of vipers, even now, the axe is at the root of the tree for those that aren't fruitful. I'm paraphrasing. For those that aren't fruitful. So you see an unfruitful tree with an axe at its root and you see a fruitful tree. Um, and, and very often in icons, if you look around, you'll see a hand from various saints kind of almost gesturing like this. What, what, what does that sort of seem to gesture? It's almost like a, a welcoming gesture, isn't it? It's almost gifting you something. So I'm saying welcome. In the Last Supper, you'll see Christ with his arms outstretched. Welcome. This is so much more than just about these 12 people you see around you. This is about you. I am the bread of life. I am the, I'm the wine. I am the blood that you need for salvation. I'm your atonement. Welcome. You'll see, you'll see St. Maurice even like gesturing like this. What is he saying? He's saying, yes, this might be my Theban legion, but actually you're part of this legion. If you want to do the right thing, if you want to live God's way, live like these people. Any questions so far? If not, I'm going to, I'm going to close up in two minutes. Yeah, go on. The letters on the icon of Christ, on the book, the letters... Okay, well, uh, Alpha and Omega. Um, when, when, when did we hear Christ say anything about Alpha and Omega? Anyone? Give me a book. Revelation, yes. When he appeared to St. John in Revelation, he said, I am the Alpha and Omega, says the Lord. 
the first and the last. I am, the, I am he who is, who was, and is to come. So the Alpha and Omega, respectively, are like the first and the last letters of the Coptic alphabet. So that's just an indication of who we think he is, who he says he is. Any other major questions? Yeah. Can you repeat again how we know if it's an archangel? Yeah, an archangel is usually denoted by two things. One, um, by a band around his head, and secondly, by an authoritative staff. Any other questions? Okay, I noticed in the footstool of St. Mary you have uh, typologies of her in the Old Testament. I tried for the life of me to understand what's etched in Christ's footstool. Can you kind of explain that? I have to admit, when we did the carpets and the footstools, I actually asked my assistants to do the carpets. <laughs> so I haven't had a good look myself. Let's have a look. <clears throat> okay. So in the top left, if you can just about see it, you'll see a fruited tree, seven fruited tree. Um, in ancient Egyptian mythology, again, there was always around a very virtuous um, a person or a virtuous god, you'll see a sycamore tree surrounding them as if it was the tree of life, a life-giving person. So Christ is always related to the tree of life. In the, in the bottom left, you'll see um, a seraphim, six-winged seraphim. Now, we know that seraphim always surround God and his throne. Whenever we hear of seraphim, they're always surrounding God, no other real person but God himself. Yes, they have various moments in the Old Testament where they appear to, say, Isaiah. But generally, seraphim denote that the person you're seeing here is of great importance. It's God. You see the four fish. The four fish in iconography, as in the flight to Egypt, um, are symbols of the four Gospels. So the four Gospels speaking about Christ prophetically or in hindsight. In the right-hand side, you'll see um, a peacock. Anyone know what a peacock symbolized in ancient mythology? Greco-Roman, actually. Anyone? Peacocks were, because they're so beautiful, birds of paradise. So they, they are talking symbol symbolically of the paradise to come, not just this earthly life, but paradise to come. Uh, is there anything else? <laughs> you'll, you'll see actually some zigzag lines that if you see the flight to Egypt are the ancient Egyptian way of describing the Nile or the water of life so Christ symbolically is the water of life as he spoke to the Samaritan woman oh, I think I've had enough of your time now yes T you bosom of the father uh, all right let's let's go through this really fast <clears throat> So um, if you think about the ocean, the very deepest part of the ocean is deep, deep blue. So in iconography, we use deep, deep blue as a symbol of the uncharted waters or the, the unknown mysteries of God. So whenever you see a deep, deep blue, especially surrounding God, and the deeper it is, the more mysterious, the more unknown to us. So immediately around Christ is the deepest blue in this icon. And of course, at the top is the deep blue coming from the Father. As we ascend down to earth, the blue gets lighter and lighter, more like a sky blue. So we're, we're now entering the realms of man. So that's what the deep blue is. The red and the white we've already discussed. White in physics is like white light, which contains all the other colors of the spectrum in it. So he's like the most complete, the most holy, the most pure, the most magnificent person. And when we dress anyone else in white, it's because they are being deified, aspiring slowly to become more and more like Christ. The seven angels are the seven angels of the revelation um, or the angel of each church. Whenever Christ was talking to St. John, he said, let's talk about the angel of Ephesus, the angel of Corinth. I'm not sure if there was one of Corinth, but anyway, the angel of each church at that time. And they're presenting the churches to Christ to bless. Um, we know of obviously the 24 priests down the bottom uh, with crowns on their head and incense of, um, of, of, uh, of prayers, the symbols of prayers. Um, sometimes uh, Abuna... Um, Buna Peshoy asks me, why are the moon and the sun um, faced like that? It looks a bit weird, doesn't it? It looks like they may be the sun god and the moon god from ancient Egypt. Are we that fickle that we might even do that? No, the truth is, whenever we, um, whenever we do that, and I'm saying we as a royal we, going right back to the very earliest iconographers in Christianity, they always had faces on the, the sun and the moon because whenever we hear about Christ's, um, Christ's power over the earth and creation... When he speaks, they do. When he asks, they obey. So we're kind of personifying the sun and the moon, saying, um, you know, they are listeners, they are doers. They're not just idle, dead things. They are almost people doing and respecting and worshipping. Anything else? Um, you'll see Christ is actually sitting on what looks like a golden rainbow. Um, often, often this is replaced by a throne. But um, 
uh, a lovely, beautiful thing is when, when Jesus, and I'm going to paraphrase very badly, if you're going to forgive me, but when, when Jesus uh, is talking to the Father and, and he says something like, uh, and, this is, and this is paradise, or this is the kingdom, that they may know you and they may know, they know us. So it, Jesus, God, God himself is the kingdom. To be in his presence is paradise that we're awaiting. So gold in iconography talks about the glory of God. It's the most beautiful visually most beautiful material that we as humans could possibly put on paintings. So gold is always representative of the most glorious glories of God. So when we surround people in the background or in their halos with gold, it's saying this is, this is God. This is God's presence. This is God's power. So him sitting on, a, on what looks like a throne of gold, he is sitting, um, as he said, you know, what throne can you make for me? Where, you know, what resting place can you make for me? I, I sit on the heavens. I, I am in the heavens. He's almost like in the most glorious throne, which is heaven. Heaven is my throne, earth is my footstool. So that's why we have a golden throne. It's not very frequent that you see a golden throne, but I thought it was poignant in this. I think that's about it. Yeah. Any other? Oh, yeah. One more question. Last question. Is, is there a guideline to how to kind of draw your icons? Like, is each artist have a different style, or is there something that you need to follow? Yeah, good question. Is there a guideline for all iconographers to follow, or does every artist do exactly what he wants? Um, I think a good metaphor for this might be um, anyone who listens to classical music. Uh, you know, it's the same piece by Beethoven, or Mozart, or Debussy, and a million different artists, musicians, and they play the same piece. But if you listen carefully, you will see the nuance between each musician. There will be something that recognizes, oh yeah, that's such and such musician, that's such and such musician, even though it's the same piece. It's the same in iconography. We're all playing the same music, but we have our nuances. Um, but to completely make up new notes for Mozart or Beethoven is not within our, our realm. We're trying to, we're not painting for ourselves or for our own fame. We're trying to paint for the church. These are orthodox images that are for the church, by the church. So we're just playing the same music with slightly different nuance. You know, I might have, for instance, a particular color palette that another iconographer doesn't have, but it's the same color. Same red, that sort of thing.